I am Daniela Camboni for StansberryInvestor.com, and we have a very special guest for you today. Joining me today is Jim Rickards. He is the six-time best-selling financial author, and his latest is The New Great Depression. Jim predicted the worst economic crisis in U.S. history, and he is now uh, showing us how to survive it. Jim, welcome back to StansberryInvestor.com. Always fantastic being with you. So happy to see you again. Thank you, Danielle. It's great to be with you again. So I I cooked up a few goodies for us (laughs) to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm always happy to get to get your insights and the real deal uh, behind behind the situation. So I want to pick it up uh, from our last discussion because I had a lot of feedback. You brought up uh, your deflationary thesis. And of course, a lot of the feedback I got was saying, you know, how could Jim say that we're in a deflationary environment or deflation is our biggest threat? Is he out of touch with reality? And before I hand over the, the mic, mic to you, um, I had watched another interview where you, you had explained your thoughts like this. You said, let's say I go out to dinner and I tip the waitress. The waitress takes a taxi home and she tips the taxi driver. The taxi driver takes the tip money and puts gas in his car. In that example, my dollar tip had a velocity of three, the waitress tip, the taxi tip, and the gasoline. So my dollar produces a velocity of three. My $1 produces $3 of goods and services. That's velocity. But what if I stay home, don't go out, and don't spend any money? So then your money has no traction. But as we're coming out of this pandemic, we're in an economic recovery gym, uh, would you not say that it's a different situation today? No, uh, the situation is the same, actually, in some ways worse. Um, in, a, in any debate, Danielle, between inflation and deflation, or any subject for that matter, the first thing I always insist on is we, we have to agree on uh, our definitions. We have to agree on our terms. We don't have to agree on policy or outlook or forecast or anything else. But if we, if we can't agree on the definitions, then we're kind of not having, we're talking past each other and it's kind of a waste of time. So let's... Let's define inflation. It sounds like gee, everyone knows what inflation is. Actually, no. Um, if you're talking about consumer prices, and that is the definition I use because that's the definition the Federal Reserve uses. And if you're trying to forecast policy, maybe you can disagree with them, but if you're thinking differently than they are, then you're not gonna know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing, but you need to know what they're doing. So um, so they they look at consumer prices. There, um, there are 10 different measures. There's the you know CPI, um, CPI core, something called PCE, personal consumption expenditure deflator. We don't have to get you know too bad. There are ten different measures, but they're all about prices you pay for stuff. So um, you know, milk and bread at the store, gasoline at the pump, uh, medical costs, tuition, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I mean by inflation. That's what the Federal Reserve think. Now, there is this Austrian school, Austrian School of Economics. And they say they count asset prices as inflation. So stock prices, uh, Bitcoin, for that matter, um, uh, you know, gold, silver, land, you know, et cetera. And they say, look, that's inflation. The stock market set an all-time high, et cetera. Well, that's not my definition. Now, if you count asset price inflation increases as inflation, then we're sort of talking past each other. Now, I do agree that there are bubbles. I think the stock market's a bubble. I think other bubbles are forming. I certainly think Bitcoin's a bubble, but that's not, um, and it's kind of, if you want to call it inflation, that's fine. But if we're going to have a debate, I'm talking about consumer prices. Now, when you talk talk about consumer prices, there is no inflation. It doesn't exist. And immediately someone says, well, I just fill up my, my, car with gas and it was you know $3.50 it used to be $2.20 okay you're right but uh the price of technology the price of computers the price of tuition the price of a lot of things price of clothing etc have all come down and continue to come down so all these indices they're baskets you know it's like well you spend a certain amount on clothes a certain amount on computers uh you, you know iPhones uh tuition etc and they look at the basket there's no inflation in the basket. There just isn't. Uh, if you want to pick a particular thing, gasoline at the pump is a good one. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. I, I I put gas in my car, but there's no inflation. Now, if you want to talk about asset bubbles, that's to me that's a completely different subject. A no, big I one, think, yeah, an important I think, one. 
the, the feedback were after our last talk, I think most people were referring to consumer prices. And like you rightfully said, the first thing they, they said, well, doesn't Jim go and pump his gas? Doesn't Jim buy milk and toast? Um, yeah, I do. And I also, and I also buy clothes and, uh, you know, they're practically giving them away. So, uh, yeah, if you want to, if you want to, the, there's selective perception people pick one thing. And again, gas at the pump is, is real. I mean, I put, like I said, I put gas in my car. Uh, and if that's all you're thinking about, but that's not an index. That's one good tuition prices are dropping. Healthcare prices are dropping. Clothing prices are dropping. Technology prices are dropping, et cetera. And people ignore all those things like they deserve it, like it's a gift uh, and, and focus on the one or two things that are going up. I mean, I'm not making it up to you. I mean, look at the indices. Go go to the, uh, the Department of Commerce in the United States and look at the Bureau of Economic Affairs and look at their um, PC core deflator or CPI. They're all going, they're, they're either down or flat. They're not going up. So when Jerome Powell says we will see transitory inflation, what is your response? Well, you have to, again, what does he mean? He's talking about base effects, meaning, so we're, we're now entering, we're in the second quarter, okay? What happened in the second quarter of 2020? The, con- the U.S. economy went down 31%. It was the greatest drop since, uh, uh, it, greatest quarterly drop on an annualized basis in history. And for the year, it was the greatest drop since 1946. So when you have an economy like that, and then you come into 2021, when they measure inflation, what are they actually saying? Well, they have the basket of goods and services, but they're they're looking at it um, either month over month or they're looking at a, a month year over year. So they're comparing, for example, April 2021 to April 2020. So uh, a monthly data series on a year over year basis. If that's your comparison, yeah, inflation is going to go up, but that's only because the bottom fell out last year. You have to look at the at the base. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, I fell in a 50 foot hole. I climbed out 10 feet. I'm still, I'm still 40 feet in the hole. So yeah, so what, what he was saying is that um, in the coming months, you're going to see some upticks in some of those indices. That's true. But that, that's in comparison with the worst year since 1946. And so that's to be expected. My question is, where are we in the fourth quarter? Where are we in early 2021, sorry, 2022 rather, when the economy was recovering? For that matter, it recovered in the third quarter of 2020. Those base effects are gonna go away. So he's talking about three months. Um, The reason is not because prices are skyrocketing, it's because we're comparing it to a a collapse. Moving on to the Federal Reserve, or or should I say sticking to the Federal Reserve here, Jim, they recently discontinued updating their M1 and M2 weekly money supply series. This has been a series in effect since 1970. Right. Now, is this no news or news of significance? And does it show us perhaps a shift in attitude uh, from the Fed here? I I think it's significant. I think it's, um, you know, it's not a fraud, but it's kind of a cover up. Uh, Look, they're, um, first of all, those, those numbers are skyrocketing. M2 in particular, uh, is off the charts. It, it's, it's going up by tens of trillions. Um, so I, I tend to look at base money, and I understand that base money is not the money you spend. Uh, that's what the Fed creates when they buy government securities and primary dealers, and the dealers, which are banks, just give it back to the Fed. So, you know, I, you're, you're a bank and I'm the Fed, and I buy a bunch of treasury notes from you, and I, and I send you the money out of thin air. And you take the money and give it back to me as part of your reserve position. Well, the money didn't help the economy. It, it went back and forth between us. So the accounting entries, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but that's not, um, uh, th- there's no velocity behind the money at all. Now, M1, that's the money that the banks create when they, you know, you apply for a mortgage and they go, okay, your mortgage is approved. Here's the money. They just put it in your account. Again, it comes out of thin air. That, uh, that kind of money is can can result in inflation but it's not and the reason it's not is because people are saving it and i just i looked at uh, my bank account the other day and i got there was fourteen hundred dollars in the IRS. i said what's this it was it was my handout check from from joe biden you know i don't i don't think i'm entitled to one but i got one <laughs> maybe i am i, I haven't really focused on it. but i'm not going to spend it i'm not running out today saying hey i'm, I'm having uh, drinks on you know drinks on me i'm just leaving it in the bank and that's what people are doing. They're saving it and they're, or they're paying down debt. But when you pay down debt, it's the same as saving. You're, you're shrinking your balance sheet. 
Uh, but what you're not doing is spending it. And that's the key. That you can print all the money you want. They have printed all the money they want, but it's not being loaned. It's not being lent. It's not being spent. And therefore, there's no velocity. And we're not getting the economic growth. But what, what do you think of Powell's thought process? Because in, in his recent testimony, he basically said that money and the measurement of money um, doesn't really matter because it's unrelated to inflation. Well, he's sort of saying what I'm saying, which is the key, the key to inflation is velocity. And velocity is psychological. Velocity is not something the Fed can control. They probably wish they could, but they can't. Yeah. They can they can create, they can control base money to like two decimal places. They can stick the landing, make base money, whatever they want. But they can't make you spend it. They can't make me spend it uh, if we don't want to. If you know, people, you know, if you're if you um, you know, just the broader population, if somebody lost their job. They're not spending money. They're saving every penny they can because they got to, you know, pay pay the rent or whatever. OK, what if you didn't lose your job? Well, you might be worried that you will. Like maybe you're next. Maybe your company's shutting down next week. People are just saving the money. It's in yeah. the day. Man, this, I, I want to make it clear, Danielle. Yeah, this is not Jim's hypothesis. This is what the data says. Got my, if you have if I have critics, I say, don't yell at me. Go look at the data and then get back to me. I want to bring up uh, the IMF and special drawing rights now. Anyone who's followed your work knows that you've written about this extensively. Um, but I didn't get a chance to speak with you about the announcement of the largest ever increase in SDR allocations, right. which will greatly improve the liquidity of many developing nations, but it also signals an alignment between the US and China. How, how um, important is this uh, news item for us, Jim? Because I Very, felt like, you know, it wasn't covered by mainstream media, obviously, yeah. kind of was under the radar. But, you know, why, why is it important for us to discuss here? Well, it's, first of all, it's very, very important. And uh, I always say, uh, and you're right, it didn't get a lot of coverage. But I always say the, the, the IMF is, is transparently non-transparent. And what I mean by that is they issue press releases and have press conferences and they, they tell you what you're doing. You can go to the website, but nobody understands it. It's all jargon. It's highly technical. So it's like, whatever. So let's, let's just talk about what an SDR is. You know, it's not strawberry daiquiri on the rocks. It's a special, it's drawing a special, right. special drawing right. Okay, what is a special drawing right? It's world money. Well, why don't they call it world money? Because they don't want you to think that that's what they're doing. So the Federal Reserve... By the way, why don't we call it the Central Bank of the United States? It's because Americans hate central banks, but we have one. It's called the Federal Reserve. Um, so the Federal Reserve is a printing press. They can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press. They can print euros. The IMF has a printing press also. They can print SDRs. They can print these special drawing rights. They are world money, and they're handed out to the members. Like You and I can't go to the ATM and get some SDRs, but if you're a country who's a member of the IMF, you will get some. And they come out of thin air. It's again, it's the same way the Fed creates dollars, the same way the ECB creates euros. Uh, and they just hand them out. And they, by the way, they're not new. They were created in 1969 um, at a time when there was um, uh, perceived to be a shortage of reserves, a shortage of liquidity. Uh, it was a way to create liquidity out of thin air. That's all money creating, money printing ever is. Um, so why now? Uh, well, in part, it's a response, you know, economic growth around the world. Everything is so much worse than you're hearing because uh, everyone requests it to the stock market. Oh, stock markets are at an all time high. Great. You know, you said some of my critics said I'm detached from reality. Well, I'm not, but the stock market is. The stock market is very detached from reality, but it is at an all time high. You can't fight the tape. But um, the, the point being, uh, the economy is not doing that great. And so this is meant to give it a boost. It will fail, it won't work. But they're going to try. They think they think it's going to work. Now there are a couple of problems with SDRs. One is um, so they only go to countries. By the way, if you read the uh, this this is a, a geek fest. But if you read the articles of association of the IMF, they're allowed to give SDRs to parties other than member countries, not you and me or the audience. But they can give them to the United Nations. They can give them to the World Bank. They can give them to various multilateral organizations for anything they want. So they have, they have not done that yet, but they have the ability to do that. But just take it to the countries. So there are, I think, 189, maybe 190 countries who are members of the IMF. They all get SDRs in proportion to their capital accounts. Well, guess who has the biggest capital account? The United States, you know, and, and so forth. So the top capital accounts are really the G7 countries 
China has a little slice, they're, they're coming up, but, but most of the SDRs do not go to poor countries. They do not go to Africa or South Asia or parts of South America or Central America that really need it. They go to the United States, China, Canada, you know, France, Germany, and Italy, and, and, and a few other countries. So what good does that do if those are the richer countries? Well, in, there is a secret desk inside the IMF that can buy and sell SDRs. So there's a secondary market in SDRs. And if you're, I'll give you an example, that's a real one. If you're China and you have a lot of dollars and you want to dump dollars, which they do, and let, uh, let's say that's one side of the right. trade. The other side of the trade is country in Africa. I, hey, I got these SDRs, what am I going to do with them? I need dollars. You can sell your SDRs to the desk and China will buy them for dollars and then that, that way you get the dollars. So you can actually monetize them. And we know this has happened because if you look at China's reserve position over time, it's publicly available how many SDRs they receive from the IMF. That's, we know what, what that number is. If you look at the SDRs on the balance sheet of the People's Bank of China, it's greater than the number that they've been allocated, which means they have been buying in the secondary market. Jim, how does that trickle down to me, very normal person though, if this is happening? How does that affect my bottom line. Uh, the it? theory, okay, yeah. let's, separate, let's separate theory and reality. So the theory is if you print money, you're going to get some growth, you're going to get some stimulus, and you're going to get some inflation. The reality is it doesn't work any more than the Fed printing, you know, $3 trillion since the beginning of 2020. That hasn't created growth. That hasn't stimulated anything. Um, so the, the point is if, if the money is being spent, if the money's being, um, you know, like you say, through the banking system, if it's being turned into more money with more credit and leverage, et cetera, it could possibly have a stimulative effect, but it's not, it's not actually what people are doing. They're paying bills, paying debts, yeah. we're saving it. So, so in other words, the global velocity problem is no different than the national velocity problem. It's, it's, it's not there. No one has any confidence. Um Shifting topics now, I want to talk about this uh, money raising campaign that seems to be uh, taking place here in, in the United States. Uh, we had Joe Biden this week calling for, you know, higher taxes, uh, big taxes on big corporations. And at the same time, Jim, we have, uh, you know, uh, Janet Yellen said she was working with G20 countries um, to agree on a global uh, corporate minimum tax rate. Um, so, you know, what's the plan here? They're just obviously trying to p pay off um, the trillions of dollars of debt they have here. No, uh, they're trying to redistribute wealth. Uh, so, so who's Janet Yellen? Janet Yellen is sort of a geeky, uh, simplistically oriented labor economist. Now that, that's, that's who she is. That was her academic background. She somehow worked her way up in the Federal Reserve System. She was a completely clueless Fed chairperson, Fed chair, didn't know what she was doing. Uh, how many times between um, 2014 and 2017 uh, you know, did you hear her say that uh, you know, the deflation was transitory. Your prices were going, it's transitory, it's transitory. Uh, how many times did you, talk, did you hear her talk about the Phillips curve? She, there is no Phillips curve. Phillips curve is flat. If it's flat, it's not a curve. And it changes shape, which means it has zero predictive value. So uh, she was clinging to all these old notions that somehow money would produce inflation and inflation would reduce unemployment. None of these things happened. So now she's secretary of the treasury. She also doesn't know what she's doing, but she's become the tax collector for the world. Now let's pivot. I'll, I'll answer the question directly, but let's pivot from that to modern monetary theory. Now, this is the policy of Washington, DC. I would say that the average member of Congress has no idea what MMT stands for, doesn't know anything about monetary, modern monetary theory. If you explained it, they wouldn't understand it, but it's what they're doing. It's what the Congress is actually doing. We've increased our national debt in the United States in just in the last uh, year and a half by 33%. Now, it took us 230 years to get to 21 trillion, and now we're at 28 trillion. Um, so a 33% increase in one, in just over one year. Uh, that's modern monetary theory. It says that don't worry about money printing, don't worry about debt, don't worry about the debt to GDP ratio. None of that is a problem. Just print as much money as you want and spend as much money as you want. Now, you have to read, and you may have read uh, already, usually I plug my own books, but I'll plug Stephanie Kelton's book, uh, The Deficit Myth. This is the leading um, 
uh, explication or explanation, if you will, of what modern monetary theory is. It's kind of written, it's very, um, it's poorly written. It's, it's the, the level of analysis, I would say, is juvenile, but, uh, but she's very candid about what they do. Well, she's a PhD, but that's probably a handicap, but um, she's very, very candid about what they do. And she says a couple of interesting things. She said, we don't actually need a bond market. She said, the only reason the bond market exists, it's a favor to investors. So they have a place to put their money, but we don't need it. All you have to do is give the Fed wire instructions and tell them to send the money directly to the government contractor or directly to childcare or directly to unemployment benefits. Send it to you, send it to me, et cetera. In other words, the, why go through the rigmarole of, you know, the, the Congress appropriates the spending, the Treasury borrows the money and issues bonds and the Fed buys the bonds and prints the money and puts it in the tree. Why do all that? Why don't just cut all that out? Just have the Fed, just give more instructions to have them send the money right out the door. Well, they actually could do that. I mean, that's not made up, but it shows you how they think about the bond market. They think the bond market is just, like I say, a favor to investors. What about taxes? Kelton, again, she's the leading light on this. She's not a nobody. Um, she says, we actually don't need taxes to pay the debt. The whole idea that there's a debate in Congress, but we want to do this, you know, $10 trillion Green New Deal, uh, $5 trillion for infrastructure, whatever it is, you know. And by the way, the infrastructure bill is mostly, um, you know, it's child care, it's uh, um, a pre-K pre education, it's um, it's when, it's a lot of things, but it's not infrastructure. Um, but, but be that as it may, the debate in Washington used to be, okay, maybe it's a good idea, but we can't afford it. And her answer, the MMT answer is, yes, we can. What's the problem? Just borrow the money. Although you don't even have to do that. You can just send it from the Fed. Just, just create the money out of thin air as they do. Um, that has now become the conventional wisdom. I mean, I've been watching politics in Washington since the 1960s. I've never seen anything like it. It's not just the numbers. The numbers are, are way, way off the charts. It's the attitude. It's the, it's the, well, you know what? Actually, yeah, what is the problem? We had a... $2 trillion bailout bill under Trump last uh, March. We had another $1 trillion bailout bill at the end of December. We had a $1.9 trillion bailout bill uh, two weeks ago. And we're going to have another $3 trillion later this year. What's the problem? Hmm. That's what they say. But so then coming back to your question, Danielle, which is taxes, Kelton and the MMTers actually say, well, no, we, you don't need taxes to pay the debt. Don't worry about the debt. Just borrow the money and spend it. But you do need taxes to redistribute wealth. In other words, take money from people who work hard and earn it and give it to everybody else. Well, that's what they're doing. And by the way, who's the head of the Senate Budget Committee? Bernie Sanders. That's the gatekeeper on new spending. Who was, who was the economic advisor to the Sanders campaign in 2016 and 2020? Stephanie Kelton. In other words, she's not. She is Bernie Sanders right hand when it comes to his understanding and by the way he's a guy who honeymooned in moscow and and is a communist he he says so it's not again this is not name calling by jim america's bernie sanders ran as for the mayor of burlington and later united states senator as a socialist but he says you know i kind of agree with cuba and, and all the rest so these people are not on the fringe anymore they're not cranks they're not uh people easily ignored they're running the country uh, and so, yeah, you're going to see huge tax increases, but don't make the mistake of thinking it's to pay for anything because they say you don't need to pay for anything. Just print the money. This is a way of redistributing wealth. Fascinating insights, Jim. I want to wrap here uh, with your latest bestseller, already a bestseller, even though it just came out in January, uh, The New Great Depression. I said at the start, you warned us about the greatest economic crisis. Now you're preparing us uh, and trying to safeguard our money and wealth uh, during these times. I know, I know you've recently upped your forecast on gold. In the past, I know it was 10,000. You've now moved it to, to 15,000. Is this still the ultimate asset for you, Jim? It is. Uh, it's not the only asset. I've always nope. recommended a 10% allocation. Like people, they always want to put words in your mouth. Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't believe the end of the world is coming. Uh, I recommend a 10% allocation. So it's an extremely... Good asset. So, um, for for two reasons, number one, we talked earlier about deflation, and yeah, there is some there are, there are deflationary trends that are very powerful. They're not going away soon, 
But I expect it'll last for a year, maybe a little bit into 2022. But then sooner than later, meaning 2022, 2023, we're going to be hit with the greatest inflationary wave. The inflation is coming. It is definitely coming. It's just not here yet. And so, um, so when that happens, the the you know gold is going to soar, obviously, and and uh, it's a good asset to have. Uh, I guess my last question to you, Jim, is you know you you talked about the greatest economic crisis. How badly bruised? do you think we emerged? Do you think we, were you expecting worse? Yes. Um, and uh, l- let me put it this way. Um, so my book came out in January. It's right. called The Great Depression. Uh, but a lot of it was written last spring. I, I updated it in the fall because they pushed the publication date back. So it's very fresh. But um, I was working a lot, of, a lot of it last spring. And, you know, I obviously said, we're, I, it's not, I'm not forecasting a depression. We're in a depression. We're in it. And I'm describing it. Uh, people go, oh, well, the stock market's had an all-time high, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> the stock market's in a world of its own. Uh, the S&P 500 is driven by seven stocks. We know what they are. Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, and Netflix. Uh, they're 40% of the market cap of a cap-rated index. So, and they're the least affected by the pandemic. So I understand where the stock market's going. I would say it's a bubble, but you know, you don't want to short bubbles. You can lose a lot of money being right. Uh, but it's very detached from the real economy. And two things about the real economy. These jobs have not come back. We're, we're not yet at 2019 levels of output. Not only did we suffer badly in 2020, we haven't even got back to where we were in 2019, either in terms of employment or output, number one. Number two, um, when you see the unemployment figures coming down in the United States, as they have from 13% to 11, now they're down around 6.4. Um, it could be off a, by a fraction there, but around 6.4%. Everyone says, see, we're back on our way to full employment. No, because that ignores something called labor force participation. It ignores 10 million able-bodied adults between the ages of 25 and 54 who have dropped out of the workforce. They're not counted as unemployed. Why, if you're a bartender and every bar in town is closed, why, you're not gonna look for a job as a bartender, there aren't any. And so, um, and so those people are home, they're, they're around, but they're not counted as unemployed. If they were, uh, which in my opinion they should be, and they, they comes up in the U6 figure, that number is 11.1% unemployment using counting the people I just described. That's the depression level of unemployment. And then the third thing people say is, uh, well, Jim, you know, you, you know, the economy's back, but it's not, but uh, um, you know, how can you call it a depression? Well, I point out that the Great Depression conventionally defined lasted from 1929 to 1940. It was 11 years. Well, we're only a, a little over 11 months into this. So, you know, call me in a year, two years from now and see where we are because the signs don't look good. I'll call you uh, much uh, much okay. earlier than that, but I urge everyone in the meantime uh, to get a copy of the new Great Depression. I know you're also uh, going to be coming out with a book that everyone's uh, eagerly um, anticipating. Uh, it's the first book you have co- you are co-writing with Robert Kiyosaki. Right. Uh, I know it's going to be called The Ravens. The Ravens, right? Coming out later this year. We're coming not quite at the stage of uh, talking it up, but right. yeah, we're uh, it's a work in progress, but it'll be coming soon. Eagerly awaiting that. Um, Jim, thank you so much for joining me here on Stansberry Investor. Thanks, Daniela. And thank you all for watching. And big announcement, we're the network that has it. We will be broadcasting the debate that everyone's been waiting for, gold versus Bitcoin, Bitcoin versus gold, whatever you want to call it. But it's Frank Dustra versus Michael Saylor. And you could register to have premier access for the event at DanielaCombonate.com. It will be airing premier access April 21st. So be sure to sign up for that. Uh, In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. We'll have much more for you. Be sure to stay tuned. That's it for me. I'm Daniela Combonate.